And this is why the, the US is critical. So one of the things that can be kind of depressing, like, okay, well, we're here, we're in the US, we're trying to fight global hunger, we're trying to fight climate change, what can we do, and does, does our choices really matter, does my burger really matter, and if I choose a garden burger over a beef burger, does it really matter, and here's why it does. So the US, in addition to being massive over-consumers of animal products, and I say that cautiously, because as a vegan, I don't want to say any consumption is good. So, but within the realm of consumption, we are high, high uh, heavy consumers of, of animal products, and animal products themselves are overconsumption. So because of that, there's a lot we can do to decrease that's going to make a big difference. But also, if we make that a priority, if the U.S. makes it a priority to reduce our own consumption, that gives us moral authority on the international scale. Our own policies are going to affect international policies. We're in very tight with the U.N. and the other high-income countries. We're usually the holdout on international policy change. Um, a lot of treaties will be signed, and we won't sign on. So if we can get some momentum from the base, and that's going to make a big difference. This is my last graph, I promise. So this is showing um, the different countries along the scale. Again, this is a GDP scale, which means that the amount of money, so this is basically the country's wealth. And you'll see that the US is uh, the, the farthest one out. And then it's also the higher up the red dot is, the more meat consumption there is. So you can see, again, that very consistent trend with the more money a country has, the higher their animal consumption. And the US is, is out there with the, the highest amount of money and the highest meat consumption. So, but as that, there's a lot we can do to, to reduce. And this helps us get to the tipping point. I know a lot of people know about tipping points, so uh, I want to bring that in just briefly. We're, we're still in this upward stage here where we're working really hard to get the point across, but it's starting to happen more. We've got more vegan options. Again, when I was going vegan, I didn't get to have vegan ice cream and vegan pizza. Now I do. Not that I'm advocating it. This is a health conference. Don't eat vegan pizza and ice cream. But anyway, it was a lot harder. It was a lot harder. But, um, and this is also, though, where even if you're not vegan, you can still help. Even if you, a lot of these vegan products that are out there, it's increasingly popular. They're getting bought out by these big animal agriculture companies uh, because it's so popular. Because really, they don't, it's not that they want to kill animals. You don't have those executives saying, oh, I get to kill some animals. Oh, I get to confine some animals. They don't care. They just want the money. So the more profitable we can make vegan options, uh, the, more, uh, the more they're going to put them out there, the lower the price point's going to be. Uh, a big part of meat consumption is social. So the more your friends are doing it, the, you know, the, if it's trendy, it's popular, if it's accepted, even if you're just kind about it, you know, that's going to help. So eating more vegan products, meat alternatives, dairy alternatives, eggs alternatives, that helps create more demand. So even if you're not fully vegan, you're helping others who might go all the way and be more vegan. So that's why um, it's important on this tipping point. And a really good example of the tipping point is uh, what we see with gay marriage. So just think, you know, a, f a few years back, gay marriage was not even on the table. And whether you're you're happy or not happy about that, I don't know, but certainly you can see that um, at some point it just became the new value that it should be okay, and then boom, now, now, now we have it. And uh, there's still, it doesn't mean all the work's done, there's still work to be done, but it's a really good example of how social change can be boom, 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 slow, 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 and then boom, you hit the tipping point and it becomes a lot easier and faster. And if we can just even get value shifts, it's not going to make meat disappear, but it's going to make it a lot easier to reverse some of those, those trends. And again, we're very pragmatic. We're talking about like reversing the trends, slowing the trends. It's not my magic wand making a vegan world. I know, it's under the, it's under the table. So, uh, we were talking a little bit about China last night, how they are actually starting to talk about reducing meat consumption, even though they're only half as much as us, they're realizing the, the, how it's not sustainable and the impact of it, and so they've been pushing increased meat consumption as a policy for quite some time, and now they're starting to pull it back and wanting to not go much further. We don't know if that's really going to happen, but there's 
it's important that there's at least language. So China might actually be the one <laughs> to start leading the way to, to reduce global uh, uh, meat consumption. So, but by the US, we, we were setting a bad example. So people do emulate the US. Uh, we're one, the most powerful country in the world. There's an association with power and wealth. So, but we, what you wanna say instead is, don't follow our example. If we can put our priorities out there, we can start reducing consumption. We can say, don't follow our bad example. Right now, we don't have credibility. We lack credibility because we're such over consumers, we're such high consumers, but we lack credibility. But what we can say is don't follow our bad example. Don't follow our health mistakes. Don't follow our environmental mistakes. Don't follow our animal mistakes. Learn from our mistakes. Don't follow our bad example. And instead, what we must do then is reframe meat. Again, don't have my magic wand, it's not gonna disappear, but if we reframe it from celebrated to shunned, that can make a huge difference. And with this, I'll bring in the smoking example, right? So smoking used to be fine. You'll, you'll hear this example a lot, but smoking, you know, doctors did it, you were allowed to do it inside, it was cool. Um, but now it's not, it's still around. It didn't disappear, it wasn't made illegal, but societal values shifted and now smoking rates are much less in the, the US. So if we can think about really on a practical scale, we can do that with meat consumption and that's happening a little bit, but we really wanna get that going faster because when we're talking about the climate change as we are, we don't have much time. And, and certainly uh, the longer it takes us, you know, at a million animals dying every hour, the, you know, the, the time is really critical from an animal perspective. So from celebrated to shunned. And the way we do this is by embracing vegan food and farming. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and farming also, uh, we do focus on veganic farming because there's a lot of misconceptions that you need uh, manure to raise food and you don't, it's pretty gross. Um, you can, but you don't need it, uh, composting, there's lots of ways to, to do it, and a lot of people uh, don't have animals who are able to farm just fine, and then we have groups like um, Grow Where You Are uh, that, that does it intentionally and is teaching on it. There's a lot of uh, groups that are starting to, to do more with this. And this is Giovanna Cook, she, that's, that's one of our shirts she's wearing, the Vegan Food Partners for Africa. She just got back from Kenya with um, a program that we supported, her going there for a month, um, bringing her four-year-old uh, Sabali with her. And they planted a, a veganic uh, produce garden at an orphanage, as well as just sharing information that they know and receiving information from the vegans in Kenya. And we're gonna try to do this on a broader scale. So these are one of our, our food partners, and they're based just out of the Atlanta area. And they're also part of our Plants for Hunger campaign. And so I'm just gonna really briefly, our time's good. I'm, so I'm, I'm excited that the timing worked out well here. So this is our Plants for Hunger program. You can see more at awfw.org backslash gifts. Uh, also our website though is set up to be very easy to navigate. We didn't put it, make it really flashy and blingy. We really actually focused on keeping it simple and making the content easy to find. So if you uh, want research numbers, uh, it's easy to find on, online. But this is our Plants for Hunger program and it's a direct response and alternative to Heifer International. So I've been giving hunger talks for a long time and uh, just about every time somebody would raise their hand and want to know about Heifer International. And I would kind of just be like, oh, I know they're irritating, but we're worried about the systems. You know, we're talking about global systems here and not this one nonprofit that's annoying. And Heifer International is the group that gives live animals um, to people in low income countries um, uh, to, to supposedly help them with, with food. There's lots of problems with that. We have information specifically on why animal gifting is bad. Uh, first off, animals require a lot of food and water. Uh, they require medical care. If you hardly have enough uh, resources to feed your own family, it's, it's hard to feed an animal. Uh, people think they're just grazing. They're actually, many of the policies are no grazing because grazing is so detrimental to the environment. So they have to still be confined and food and water has to be brought to them. Animal care, medical care. So it's, it's, it's not just that easy. A lot of the communities are lactose intolerant. So it's not uh, just like, oh yeah, you get milk. But if your body doesn't uh, digest milk, that's not a good thing. 
So anyway, there's lots of information, but this is our, our alternative. It's called Plants for Hunger. And what we do is we raise funds, especially over the holiday season. This is a great gift to give and receive if you're vegetarian, vegan, or just whatever else. Um, Heifer International also makes hundreds of millions of dollars, and we work with small groups. So even if it's just for the economy of it, even if it's not your thing, just for the economy of knowing that your dollar is going to make a really big difference for groups that are doing work hands-on um, in, in the ground and don't have a lot of money. So um, these are hand-picked by me. This is a group in Guatemala, the Ethiopian School Lunch Program that I talked about earlier. We also have a program in India. Um, it's not our program. Again, we find the programs and send them money. And then um, the community food gardens in the U.S. is Giovanna and Grow Where You Are, who I just mentioned earlier. So all the money we receive, we send out 100% no fees to those groups directly. And um, sometimes we even do a matching when we can. So uh, I'm really excited about that program, providing an alternative so that you don't have to support meat programs in general, which uh, any kind of feeding program, if it's not specified, is a meat program. So you're sacrificing animals to feed people when you don't need to, or specifically sending live animals uh, to, to other countries. And so that's it. Again, I'm Don Moncrief, a well-fed world. Thank you.